Well, we are on our last message of a series called At the Movies, where we've been uh, looking at, it was four, but it's really three different movies because we got messed up with one and copyright problems and all of these things that we seem to have been done fine last week. So we're going to look at our last one. Some of you saw this a Wednesday night, and it's called Home Team. Yeah. This was also, I guess, based on a true story. And since I am not a big football fan or anything, Roy confirmed that for me, so I trust him in understanding uh, that it was an actually true story. I'm sure they took a lot of liberties with this film. Uh, let me just give you the, the highlights. I, I up front say, by the way, all spoiler alerts in here. So if you just want to go la 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 la, just do it without saying la 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 la. Uh, these are not like big major motion pictures like, you know, the Avengers, but uh, this, this is, these are a little bit more obscure. But this, is, this stars Kevin James as King of Queens fame there and, and stuff. He is the pro football coach for the Saints. Where are they from, Roy? New Orleans Saints. Thank you. I'm here. How do I know? Uh, and he gets a year suspension from that. And in the movie, he goes back to his hometown where his ex-wife and uh, his son, who he's trying to reconnect with during that time because he hasn't been around, because he's the pro football coach for the Saints. Uh, and he ultimately ends up coaching his son's youth team. Uh, and all of the ins and outs and comedy and drama and everything else of that. It's a good movie. It's fun. Uh, with a good message, right? Now, there are sports. For instance, you know, most of you know, you know, as um, I've uh, been doing karate for a long time, and in and, and all the times I've competed in that sport, it's just me against the world. You know, everyone else that's competing. It's an individual sport. Now, there can be some exceptions if there's a, a t two people doing something together and stuff, but for the most part, it's just me. You know, I'm competing against myself and against other individuals, right? Um, track and field is a lot like that in most of these events. If you're running a race, unless it's a relay, it's you against everybody else. It's not, it's, there's no team there. If you're uh, doing the, uh, the high jump or the pole vault or any of those, it's you. You train, you get to be the best that you are, and, and all of that. Now, there are teams, even in, in, in uh, gymnastics, there are teams that are trying to work, but it's still individuals within that. That is so different than, say, football, where there's a bunch of people on a team, and if they don't know how to work together, it's a disaster. Like basketball, you hear sometimes in basketball, this guy is so good or this girl's so good at but shooting that they, they hog the ball. They don't pass, they don't think. In other words, they're, they're just trying to do it all themselves, and that doesn't work typically real well. You know, they could get all the shots and still lose the game, and somehow that's okay. You know, it, it's, it's teamwork that is required in team sports. And certainly, so as I walk away from this movie, that's what I want to talk about, about the team. Because it was all about teamwork. And, and in fact, when, when uh, his name is Manning, Coach Manning, uh, is asked to become the uh, coach for the offense. No, yeah, I think it was the offense. He sits down and does what he knows how to do. So you're going to watch this first clip of him getting ready for his first day of coaching his son's team. Everybody listen up. The only reason to play football is to have fun. And the only way to have fun is to win. And the only way to win is with this. 
Ano? Ay ba? Ay ba? So you made a few minor changes? Try down. Oh. Got it. Yeah, I mean, the base is all there. I just uh, just expanded on it, that's all. You know. Hey, listen, I want you to study them, take them home with you tonight, and keep them with you at all times. Yes, sir! Yes, sir. All right? Yes, sir. All right. <laughs> The church is a team, right? The church is a team. And by the way, we have a playbook. Right? We have a playbook. God has given us a playbook about what he wants church to look like, stand for, its purpose, everything that we need to know God has given us in the playbook. And yeah, we're supposed to kind of take it with us at all times because God's word is in our hearts when we read that, right? And that's the playbook that we keep going back to and asking, what is it? What does it take to win? And what I mean by winning is just simply fulfilling the purpose of God together. Because we're a team, right? And, and that's what I just kind of want us to focus on for a few moments, all right? Because we were once a society that was centered around family. Now, some of you, it's it maybe even going back a little bit further than me, which I love saying. Because uh, that was, I could say that was before my time. You know, just, uh, multiple generations of people, right, who, who often lived together under one roof, or when they did live separately as families, they were close by, right? These days, we are much, much more of an individualistic culture, right? We rely on ourselves. We can live far away from where we were raised. You know, we're going to be grandparents and our new grandchild will be 1,400 miles away. So, <laughs> uh, our connections, however, let's just talk about connections. Our connections with other people, where do they take place in our culture mostly? Actually, a lot of them take place in the workplace when we worked in the same place and not remotely, right? But even there, those connections, actually, they're, they're pretty shallow at times, right? They're pretty shallow, they're short-lived, there's a lot of transitions and stuff. But we also see in the church this sense of individualism, and that's been around for quite a while, this disconnectedness. There's a lot of people that serial date church, the serial church daters. Okay, you know what I mean by that? Uh, they don't stay in one place very long. Some may stake a claim, but remain distant. And, and there are those that actually may indeed have a committed relationship with a church, but they're not all in. They're just not all in. They're not fully known by their community, and they don't rely on the body when they're struggling or in need. A lot of times, we all, we all wear masks, right? We, we want to come in here and somehow put on this mask that says, we're doing fine, we're doing great, right? How you doing? Doing all right. My life's falling apart, but I'm doing all right, you know? And, um, and, and sometimes just covering that pain and pretending everything's okay, even though it's not. Do you know, I, I just saw, I read, either read or heard this just recently. Could have been at the Global Leadership Summit. Uh, where they were saying that one of the people's biggest fears, it's not, this is like public speaking and those things, but actually in community, one of the people's biggest fears is this, that if you really knew me, you would reject me. I would not be accepted if you really knew me. And so if that's our fear, we pretend. Yeah. And the truth of the matter is, for a lot of times, yeah, we do know you, and we still love you. So it's okay, you know, but it's a fear. And yet, individualism and doing life on our own is not a part of God's design. Right? If we are to truly follow Jesus and be the church, we have to embrace that fact. Doing life on your own is not a part of God's design. Because God is a community. 
He's actually, if you th without getting uh, uh, too deeply theological, God is actually a community within himself, right? You have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, this perfect triune self. And in creating us, God desired for us to participate in that community and know the perfect, joyous, and, and the love that the Godhead shares. But God didn't stop there. He didn't create us to just be in community with himself. He then created the world, and as you go back to the book of, of Genesis, he creates man, Adam, and this is what God says after that. Creates, creates man and says, that's not good. No, that's not what he said. It is not good for man to be alone. I need to make a helper fit for him, an equal partner. Right? That's in Genesis 2.18. God created, therefore, man and woman to be in community together, to create, to cre create families, to live together, bearing the image and re reflecting that three-in-one God. Scripture is all about community. If you go in the Old Testament, you know, God chose the Israelites to what? Be his people. And he says, this is not up on your screen. He says, I will walk among you and be your God and you shall be my people. And they lived and they worshiped him together in community. In the Old Testament, there's just a part of the individualism, I just need to say this, is a Western thought. There are other cultures more Eastern, that still have a very big understanding of community. If you go back in the Old Testament and look, that if one person sinned, it affected the entire community. God treated it like the community did it, because you're a part of a community. It's, it's not just a bunch of individuals. Right? And, and then, following the death, resurrection, of, and the ascension of Christ, God institutes the church, the body of Christ, as a community of believers. In 1 Corinthians 12, 27, Paul says this, Now you are, that's you, the body of Christ, and individually members of it. We're members of a community. So Paul Tripp says in his book, Whiter Than Snow, uh, We weren't created to be independent, autonomous, or self-sufficient. We were made to live in a humble, worshipful, and loving dependency upon God, and in a loving and humble interdependency with one another. Our lives were designed to be community projects. I like that phrase, right? And yet the foolishness of sin tells us that we have all that we need within ourselves. So we settle for relationships that never go beneath the casual. We defend ourselves when, when people around us point out a weakness or a wrong and we hold our struggles within, not taking advantage of the resources God has given us. We need to be in community. It, it's, it's what keeps us on track. Okay? This false theology all around us, right? And we are tempted with temptations every day. And our own sin leads us away from God, and we need godly brothers and sisters to watch our back. I hope you're watching my back, you know? We need to be connected in a community where we can all be alert for those things around us in the directions our lives are taking. The truth is we need each other. We need to trust on, rely on, and depend upon other believers. God gave us each other to walk alongside and encourage and spur one another on in the faith. The writer of Hebrews puts it this way. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and to good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So I, I need to say it here. COVID caused us to not meet together. And now some of us maybe have turned that into a habit of neglecting to meet together. And somehow being connected to the body of Christ has turned into an issue of convenience. I get it. 
it is easier, right? But I do feel the need to say this with all the love I know how, but with all the clarity I know how as well. Jesus is not in your convenience. He's just not. So if you've become disconnected from the body, there's a spiritual problem there. That somehow I don't need to be a part of what Jesus has created. Because you are not stirring up one another for, with love and good works and encouraging one another, and you're not receiving that. Right? You're trying to do it alone. You know, I, well before the pandemic, you know, I hear people going, well, I can just go worship God by myself. My question is always, first off, yeah, but do you? Because that's just usually a red herring excuse, you know. Um, but as Rick Warren is fond of saying, yeah, maybe you can, but you can't be a healthy Christian because there's at least 30 commands in the New Testament you can't actually obey. All the one another statements, right? See, Jesus calls us to confess our sins to one another, to pray for one another, to carry each other's burdens, to care for the practical needs of one another, to warn each other of, uh, of sin, to rejoice and to mourn with each other. And you know what? I have seen every single one of those things happen here in the last month. You're amazing, okay? And you're going to be hearing about just one in a moment. And they didn't all happen like here in the sanctuary. They didn't all even happen at a time of worship or on a Sunday morning. But they all happen because they're people who came together as the body of Christ. We are better together in the community of the body of Christ. And even though our culture can tell us we can do life on our own, God's word tells us we simply cannot function spiritually in a spiritually healthy way apart from one another. We are designed to need each other. Just one example because okay, it fits with the movie. <laughs> spiritual gifts, for instance. You know, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 12, a spiritual gift is given to each of us so that we can help one another. And then he says in, the, in two chapters later, 14, 12, so it is with you, since you are eager for the gifts of the Spirit, try to excel in those that build up the church, the body of Christ, right? So, as... Coach Manning gets the, the team. He's looking on offense. He, he, he gives them a little test. So watch this clip. Gentlemen, it's about speed. So if you don't got it, you better hurry up and get it. Now on my count, we're going to run to that 40-yard line as fast as you can. You said on my count. How many Mississippis is that going to be? How about this? One, two, three, four. Congratulations. You four just became our new wide receivers. So he has the race, the first four to cross that finish line. You're our new wide receivers. Why? Why did he pick those four? Because they were the fastest, right? Those positions that they would play, they would do that because they were gifted in speed, and it meant that it was going to make them a better team. Right? God gives each of us gifts for the building up of the body, for the benefit of the team, the body of Christ. And when that happens, you know, or I should ask this question, what happens, therefore, when we don't use those gifts in the body? People get exhausted doing things they need, that need to be done by someone, actually, who is better gifted at doing them. And the result of that typically is burnout. Uh, I got one more. It's not a clip. It was very hard for me to put together a clip to, to, to show this. So I'm just going to tell it with some pictures. So what happens in this film near the end, uh, it becomes very personal for Coach Manning because of media and everything else. If his team is not doing well in a youth team, how in the world could he ever go back to being a good coach in a pro team, right? And then he, they get this one team that just destroyed them in a, in a game that they have to now go after for the championship. 
the other coach is just loving this because if I can beat this team coached by Coach Manning, look how good I am, you know, and taunting, all of that stuff. They're running plays that he didn't quite understand, so Coach Manning calls a friend and says, hey, I've not seen this play before. The guy says, yeah, I've seen it. Uh, many years ago, this is some team did this. Here's your answer. Speed. It's all about speed. So guess what he does with those four kids? He, he gets them to play both defense and offense. In other words, you're never getting a rest. You're constantly playing this game. And the kids that were in those positions get benched. Okay, so here's this first picture. Uh, it's, the co it's the kids getting benched. You see how happy they are to be benched? <laughs> and, and then it just has a variety of different clips of, of playing. It was just going to take too long. But this next picture shows, uh, this is actually the, then Coach Manning's son. And you, you can just, just begin to look at the look on his face. That look is one of exhaustion as he's now been never having a rest. And then it happens again. And he, and he kind of just kind of falls down after a play. And, and, and it just, you see the, do you see the, uh, the closed caption, what it says there? Groaning is what it says. Uh, he is just in pain. He's exhausted. And at one point there, and they just tell the coach, we are just exhausted. And he's just so into having to win this game, he's not listening. And then there's the kids on the bench. They are just like, why are we even here? Right? All right. The ending, of course, it's a good ending of the movie. You, you, will, you will love it. It's a heart-touching thing with him and his relationship with his son, and it all is good, right? There's a good movie. The pandemic benched a lot of us. It just did. And then we got used to it. Now, however, I have to ask this tougher question. They don't think it's the pandemic now that we can use as the excuse for benching us. Now we're benching ourselves. Jim Wallace is the author of a book called God's Politics. He wrote several years ago, we have forgotten we are God's people. And we have fallen into the worship of American gods. And now God's word to us is to return. And I think we need to return back to that in it, apart from the pandemic. The church needs to turn back to the word of God like Acts chapter 2 because I think for many, many years we began to just make church and being a part of the body about our comfort. We really have. And God is making a course correction here. And we want to be about that, right? He says, uh, we should realize that community isn't an option for Christians. It's essential to our faith. The church in America especially has brought, bought into the myth of individualism. In our hymns, in our songs, in our prayers, in our organization, we have made so much of the individual's relationship with Jesus. Right? That, that makes sense. We talk about that a lot. And our responsibility to God that we've lost almost any concern for our accountability as a community. We tend to see church as nothing more than a collection of individual Christians who come together instead of an extended family of faith who may not be blood, but are brothers and sisters in Christ. And our spiritual growth has been left to our individual efforts instead of being the job of all of us as a community on a journey of faith together. What's wrong with that? Well, for one, that individualism is not biblical. The okay? Bible speaks of the people of God. Second, Jesus modeled for us what we're supposed to be, right? Not to save souls. Don't miss it. Don't say what I'm not, don't, don't hear what I'm not saying, right? That, that, not to save souls, but to make disciples who are saved, right? To invite others to join us on the journey together. That was the church. 
And, it, and it's a way the first it's the way the first Christians did it. The early church were a people who nurtured and supported and cared for each other and witnessed to their faith as a community. And as I said earlier, I've been witness to some incredible ways the body of Christ right here has been modeling that in the last month. Now I want to invite Gary Harlow on up because he's just going to tell us about his and his wife Lucy's experience of what happened here. And, and he told me about it and I said, Gary, would you just come and tell us because we need to hear the testimony. This this is an example of the value and benefits of be belonging to a church community. With Lucy's quick breast cancer diagnosis, we had another cross to bear, but we are not bearing it alone. When we were at church the Sunday before Lucy's surgery, I observed a woman coming up to Lucy here at church and pray for her. The compassion and loving support brought tears to my eyes. I was overwhelmed to see the care and concern they had for her. Many of you came to, up to both of us to encourage us and offer your support in prayer as well as in practical ways. After service, I told Pastor George how much this touched me. We wanted to express our deep gratitude and love for our church family for loving and embracing us on this journey. We know our church community is here to support us in any way that is needed, as many of you continue to reach out to us. We are so grateful God led us to Norwood Baptist Church. One of Lucy's favorite shirts to wear says, we are in this together. Jesus was our role model to demonstrate the importance of loving one another with true compassion. A practical way of showing this is assisting one another, one another in the daily crosses that we, that we all have to bear. Even the Lord Jesus himself needed help in carrying his own cross. And, and I'd like to say from my heart too that the thought is that one light only lights so much, but a lot of lights together make things very bright. And, and we need to be that bright light to a hurting world. Praise God. Thanks, Gary. Yeah, it was like I'm, I'm walking at, at it's when, you, when, you, when you called, I said, yeah, you know, I was, it was after church. I'm looking, and all of a sudden I turn around, and here's just this whole group of women praying over Lucy. And, I, and the thought occurred to me, where else does that happen? Okay? You can't get that alone. And you can't give that to someone else alone. So I just want to say praise God for being the church for being a part of the community. And if there's anything holding you back from that, I would encourage and just challenge you to be in prayer about, all right, what needs to change so that I am a vital part of the body, the community of Christ that, that receives and gives and builds one another up. Let's pray. God, thank you for the ways that that happens in so many different places. You know, that is just... I, I get, Lord, I, to, be a, to, to be the pastor of a church where that is going on, Lord, is just not only humbling, but I am so blessed to see that, to be the church of Jesus Christ. So, Lord, help us. Help us to be that more and more. Again, as I prayed earlier, give us wisdom moving forward and the strength to be that church. And Lord, may you just uh, speak to our hearts this morning on the community and the body of Christ. Amen.